The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. Good morning. In this, the last of the talks of this retreat, <clears throat> I'll be talking about virya paramita, diligence, vigor, enthusiasm, joyful effort. <clears throat> Excuse me. Virya is a Sanskrit word most often translated as energy, including perseverance, never giving up. I'll also be talking about the fourth of the four wisdoms, sympathy. One spring, I and several other monks came down with a respiratory bug. The problem was that I didn't get over it. The local doctor tested my blood and found it compatible with a viral infection and that the only treatment was to rest. So rest I did for years. Eventually, I got the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, not, in my opinion, the best name for an illness. With that illness, I needed to learn to get the most out of what little energy was available to me. So I made the effort to get up in the morning, get dressed, meditate in my room, go to meals, and feed the cat. As the months went by, I slowly added a few more things to my day until after several years, I'd regained most of the function I'd lost. But this isn't about me. I'm grateful to that illness for showing me that the practice of joyful effort isn't just for the young and healthy, strong and fit. That I could make a joyful effort by getting dressed and brushing my teeth that I had the capability to persevere, that a strong body isn't necessary for keeping a bright mind. Near the beginning of his chapter on diligence, Shantideva first defines it. He says, diligence means joy in virtuous ways. Its contraries have been defined as laziness, an inclination for unwholesomeness, defeatism, and self-contempt. And then he continues, so take advantage of this human boat, by which he means the body, mind, and life of a human being. Take advantage of this human boat, free yourself from sorrow's mighty stream. The time that you have now, you fool, is not for sleep, with an exclamation point. So the human body is the best form in which to do our practice, and that is what he is exhorting us to do. <clears throat> Shanti Deva devotes this whole chapter to encourage us, encouraging us on to joyful effort. Using both the stick uh, vivid descriptions of the fires and torments of hell, and the carrot, the cool heart of a fragrant spreading lotus, he exhorts us. The point is to get going and do our practice now as human beings while there's still time. As Dogen says, quickly the body passes away. In a moment, life is gone. We never know when our time will end. Shantideva uses the essential uncertainty of human life to spur us on to make as great an effort as we can in our training. This is not to cause despair. As he puts it, do not be downcast, but marshal all your powers. Make an effort, be the master of yourself. 
Practicing this paramita can be difficult for me at times when I fall into the mistake of thinking of myself as a person of low energy, that persistent tendency to be a me again. If only I could be like so-and-so who can work all day without stopping. And that's a form of coveting, isn't it? At such times, I recall the childhood fable of the hare and the tortoise, slow and steady wins the race, although our practice isn't a competition. Here's Shantideva on this point. He first takes the voice of someone giving in to despair. Oh, but how could I become enlightened? And then replies, don't excuse yourself with such despondency. The attitude is I couldn't possibly succeed, so why bother even try? This is a fine excuse. I don't have to do the bodhisattva practice. It's for those high energy folks who never seem to run out of energy. Laziness is said to be the opposite of joyful effort. Not just slacker laziness where it's a matter of I'd rather be daydreaming, but states of mind such as self-doubt, despondency, and despair can be seen as forms of laziness when they work against doing what needs to be done. The point is not to drink enough prote protein drink to make yourself into a human dynamo. Rather, it's to never, ever give up. Each of us can reflect within ourselves to find the purpose of our life and the wherewithal to fulfill that purpose. The perfection of joyful effort isn't only for the energetic, it's for all of us. Nor does joyful effort mean the effort to make oneself happy and peppy all the time. One book on the paramitas refers to virya paramita as stewarding resources. This is more to the point. We start where we are and use what we've got and keep on doing that. I've mentioned a few times now, I think, that my master always taught us to do the very best we could, the very best we could do with what we've got at that moment and realizing that it may change, even from one moment to the next. Another habitual tendency that can keep us from doing what needs to be done may seem to be the perfection of joyful effort, but isn't. And that's the addiction to busyness. Rushing around all day trying to complete our to-do list without reflecting on what is most important to do, over-energetic, if you will. Workaholism is a common form of addiction in our culture. What's essential is again to be still, revisit our aspiration and our intention. Stewarding resources means, among other things, Saving enough energy to balance the activities of life, family and friends, spiritual practice, recreation, rest. It, is, it isn't easy to find this balance, and fortunately, we can learn from our mistakes. Rest is an essential part of life. As Shanti Deva puts it, if impaired by weakness or fatigue, I'll lay the work aside, the better to resume. So we conserve our energy in order to do what needs to be done. This is the influence of wisdom, wise discernment. Rest now in order to be able to do later. As my master taught us, our bodies need respect. Shanti Davis says that with a steadfast heart, I'll get the better of my weaknesses. And he's talking here of character weaknesses, not body weakness. With a steadfast heart, he says, I'll get the better of my weaknesses. 
and I will be victor over all, and nothing shall prevail and bring me down. The offspring of the lion, that is, followers of the Buddha, should constantly abide in this self-confidence. I can't emphasize enough the importance of consistent meditation practice, which gives us direct access to this kind of self-confidence. Confidence in the true self. Seated meditation is an excellent opportunity to practice perseverance. We keep sitting there, neither trying to think nor trying not to think for the allotted amount of time. I always advise newcomers to this practice to start slow. Commit yourself to five minutes a day. Just about anyone can succeed at sitting five minutes, and that success gives a boost to your commitment to keep going. Eventually, five minutes will seem too little time, so increase it to 10 minutes, and then gradually upwards as it seems good. Of course, you'll miss a day sometimes, and then you can bow to your sitting place and resolve to return as soon as possible or even take three minutes sitting on the edge of the bed at night before going to sleep. What's essential is to make the commitment and keep to it to the very best of your ability. That's the steadfast heart. That's right effort, joyful effort. Self-doubt, self-contempt, despondency, despair, and other forms of negativity are all energy-sapping obstacles to the practice of virya paramita. Our wish to help all living beings includes helping ourselves. We need to take care of ourselves before we can help others. The overused analogy, and I can't think of a better one, is the instruction given on airplanes to use your own oxygen mask before trying to help others with theirs. We practice joyful effort when we take care of ourselves, spiritually, mentally, and physically. On the morning of writing this talk, I went for a 30-minute walk for exercise. I didn't feel up to it but I was able to summon up enough energy to get started. Not only did I finish the walk, I felt much better at the end of it. Sometimes you just need enough effort, enough energy to get started. A good way to take care of our negative thoughts and emotions is to recall that we're all part of Buddha nature like everyone else, and that we deserve love and respect no less than anyone else. That's a start. We remind ourselves, I'm not these negative thoughts and emotions. They're not me. And then we practice letting them go. The same way we practice letting go of thoughts and emotions and ideas and opinions during formal seated meditation. Wisdom discerns that the feelings and thoughts, like everything else, are temporary and they pass away. Perseverance comes in here because this takes time, determination, and repetition. Just as we repeat the movements when doing weight training exercises, so it's necessary to repeat the process of letting go again and again and again. And then again, that's one reason why we hear in the scripture of great wisdom, going, going, going on beyond, and always going on beyond. Back to Shanti Deva, the Buddha who declares the truth, has truly spoken and proclaimed 
that if they bring forth strength of perseverance, even bees and flies and gnats and grubs will gain supreme enlightenment so hard to find. If even gnats and grubs can gain supreme enlightenment with perseverance, that shoots down the I'm just not good enough excuse. Sometimes it gets tough and it can help to take a walk outdoors, clean something, do some vigorous exercise, or read some dharma. We offer spiritual counseling by phone and email, and it can sometimes help to talk it over with someone else who's doing the practice. I'm not talking here about clinical depression. Sometimes it can be helpful to consult a mental health professional for assistance. Don't get me wrong, I'm not recommending everyone run out and get a prescription. Just that for some people at some times, medication and or therapy can help in one's practice. Worry and guilt are also obstructions to the perfection of diligence, sapping energy that could be used in practice. I used to think that guilt would motivate me not to repeat a mistake or do better in the future. Not so. Guilt only served to reinforce the false notion of me myself as a guilty person or a wrongdoer. But as we've been saying, there is no permanent, independent, unchanging self. I exist as a convenient fiction. Clinging to feelings of guilt serves only to solidify that false sense of a me that I'm working on letting go of. I also thought of worry as a useful source of motivation. How would I ever get anything done if I didn't worry about it? What kind of person would I be if I didn't worry about people in need? With time and practice, I've come to see worry as a form of fear, and I've been able to leave it behind most of the time. However, about a month ago, I began to worry about not getting these talks done. My worry became so strong that it interfered with my daily life. Then I thought, aha, here I am, worrying. Is that going to help me get these talks ready? No. In this case, the problem had a remedy, devote more time to working on the talks and I found that the worry departed when I began doing that. Bodhisattvas live by vow. The precepts are the first vow we take, the vow to let ethical conduct guide us in our lives. A vow for bodhisattvas isn't a contract where if you break it, you'll get sued. Instead, it's the deepest wish of the heart that inspires our commitment to a path in life and energizes our joyful effort to follow that path. The first thing we say every day at the end of the morning meditation is the Kesa verse, which ends with, I wish to unfold the Buddha's teaching that I may help all living things. When we unfold the Buddha's teaching, everyone can see it. The Bodhisattva's purpose is to help all beings. This is our wish. We unfold our physical kesa so that everyone can see followers of the Buddha. We unfold the Buddha's teaching with the wish that all beings will see it and liberate themselves from suffering. Wishing that all sentient beings may understand the great doctrine and make the superlative resolution for Buddhahood. Now on to sympathy, which is the fourth of the four wisdoms, or the four signs of enlightenment, as Reverend Master Jiu sometimes used to call them. This term, which can also be translated as cooperation, comes from the Sanskrit samana arthata, 
which literally means identity of purpose or sharing the same aim. The word sympathy comes from the Greek having common feelings. It is defined in part as the act or capacity of entering into or sharing the feelings or interests of another. Reverend Master Jiyu's translation of Great Master Dogen's Shushogi says, if one can identify oneself with that which is not oneself, one can understand the true meaning of sympathy. Sympathy does not distinguish between oneself and others. This reminds me of the golden rule in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which teaches us to treat others as we would wish to be treated ourselves. And likewise, if we're beating ourselves up, sometimes we can think of treating ourselves as we would wish to treat others, with compassion, benevolence, and respect. The following passage is from Reverend Master Hubert Nierman's translation of the Shobo Genzo chapter entitled Bodai Sata Shishobo. Manifesting sympathy means not making differences, not treating yourself as different, and not treating others as different. When we really understand what manifesting sympathy means, we will see that self and other are one and the same. And later on in the passage, in particular, what the manifesting in manifesting sympathy refers to is our way of behaving, our everyday actions, and our attitudes of mind. In this manifesting, there will be the principle of letting people identify with us and of letting ourselves identify with others. Depending on the occasion, there are no boundaries between self and others. Well, that can be a bit scary, no boundaries between self and other. It can be a bit scary to me. And I've discovered that the idea of letting people identify with me and letting myself identify with others has long been a source of difficulty. At the age of maybe six or seven, I was driven by my mother to the house of a girl in my class where I was dropped off and told to play with that girl. Problem was, I couldn't stand her. I found her repulsive. Furthermore, when I went into her house, it smelled bad in there. I had a dreadful feeling that the girl's cooties remember, I was six or seven, would somehow rub off on me and taint me. My mother answered my complaints later on by telling me that the girl and her family were poor people and that we should sympathize with them. I can still see that experience resonating in my social relations, even down to today. Wanting to be around people with certain qualities and to avoid others who, in my opinion, may lack those qualities. I'm grateful now for being able to see this painful aspect of my koan, or spiritual problem, in order to be able to do something about it. We vow as bodhisattvas, whether lay people or monks, to help all beings, however innumerable they may be, including those with kutis. The Tibetan Buddhist teacher, Tubten Jinpa, says this, if we learn to relate to others from the perspective of our shared humanity, we could extend our empathetic concern to strangers and even those whom we find difficult to relate to. He mentions compassion meditations that use phrases such as, just like me, others too wish to attain happiness and overcome suffering, almost as a mantra, just like me, just like me. My experience has been that using such a phrase, not in formal meditation, but from time to time, 
has been helpful in getting around the cooties problem. Recognizing that just like me, this person is born, will die, wishes happiness, and wishes to avoid suffering. What the manifesting in manifesting sympathy refers to is our way of behaving, our everyday actions, and our attitudes of mind. For me, that's the focus of practice right there, our everyday actions and our attitudes of mind. We can pretty easily be kind to everyone while sitting in silence on our cushions or doing ceremonial. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. But what about at kitchen cleanup when it's hot, loud, and crowded? Or with those people who talk over us and don't listen to a word we say, etc., etc., on and on. Our everyday actions of body, speech, and mind are the proving ground of our practice, where the rubber meets the road. Here's where we practice joyful effort, generosity, ethical conduct, kind speech, patience, benevolence. My purpose for this retreat has been to share these practices that we can use anywhere, anytime, with anyone, in any circumstances. May we, together with all beings, realize the truth. Homage to all the Buddhas in all worlds. Homage to all the Bodhisattvas in all worlds. Homage to the scripture of great wisdom. <laughs>